it's not always just about opportunity either. You could give some people, some hunters, you could give them all year to fill their tags and they won't. And so even in some of these states that allow, and this will shock Pennsylvanians listen to this, but states that allow like four or five bucks, but nobody fill, nobody shoots four or five bucks. Most, most people don't even shoot one. I was like, well, if I throw a mic on, then I can help others the way that these people have all helped me. Born in the heart of the Pennsylvania deer camp. With the help of experts, friends, and local legends, we bring you valuable knowledge and powerful stories for your hunting adventures. Welcome to the East Meets West Hunt Podcast with your host, Bo Martani. All right, we're live from Nick Pinizzato's camp here in Pennsylvania. So, Nick, thanks for having me here. Well, this is awesome. I'm glad it worked out. Welcome to what we call Horseshoe Hills here. And uh, that comes from shortly after we bought the property, I was doing some hiking around as you might and yeah. uh, come across this really cool old horseshoe, which is hanging inside. And I looked around, we we're trying to come up with a name. I said, how about Horseshoe Hills? I like it. But uh, I'm glad we were on your path to travel and we could do this in person. This is great. I know. It was funny. We were emailing back and forth and looking at uh, scheduling a podcast together and and I was going, giving some dates back and forth. And I'm like, you know what? I said, because I knew where you lived at. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be coming through there on the way to Total Archery Challenge. And and you were like, well, you're probably going past my camp. So well, let's just meet up there. I'm like, perfect. Let's yep. do it. Yeah. And here we are. So this is great. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm excited to, to get to check it out. Beautiful place here. And thank you. Yeah. So, so far what I've seen of it, you said you're going to take me on a little bit of a, a tour around the property here after we, we finish up, but it's so cool. All Pennsylvania has so much diversity as far as the habitat, even, mm-hmm. you know, 30 minutes away can look completely different as far as driving in any direction to, to be able to see. And, and it seems like, you know, this area had some old, uh, coal mines and some strips and stuff that were here and, and, and reclaimed habitat as well as some ag ground and, and a bunch of mixture of things and, and big timber. Yeah, that's exactly what this property is. Half of it was strip mined. Uh, some of it was undermined and then the lower half wasn't. But you're right in the heart of the bituminous region here. We're in northern Indiana County. Uh, but to your point about going 30 minutes and it can be completely different. You know, I live in Indiana, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 minutes from here. And uh, you come up here just a little distance and you got the, the, the hills are a little bit bigger. You know, they're not quite yeah. the mountains that you have, but we're right on the edge of the Appalachians here. And uh, one of the cool things about these disturbed habitats is they create excellent edge for wildlife deer hunters like Mm -hmm. we are we like that and when i first looked at the property um that's the first thing i looked at is what is i always look at two things what's the opportunity what can i make it because i I always feel like you can make it what you want it to with a little work and then also what is my greatest limiting factor so what what is the thing that can get in the way of me accomplishing what i want to here and uh, when I, I looked at all the edge and the different um, benches and things throughout and the, the natural openings that were left by old gas wells, I'm thinking, well, there's, I don't have to clear land for plots yeah. and, you know, and I can do a little timber management here. And it just, it provided all of those opportunities and it's made, uh, you know, once we've got the garbage and stuff hauled off of it and, uh, you know, the, the owners that had it before lived on the other side of the state, they were elderly, they didn't, hadn't been here in years. Yeah. So you have to kind of clean up those messes, but um yeah, it's come in a tremendous way in just uh, three years. So yeah, that's that is incredible, and it it's uh it's it's really a dream of mine to be able to do this with a property at some point. Like obviously, I I do a lot of you know big woods hunting, and that's kind of what the podcast has been been known for. But I'd be lying if I didn't say like I want to I want to own a, a, a nice piece of property and do some management and learn that side of it because that's something that I don't have experience in mm-hmm. and. I think it would be so cool to see work that you do benefit the wildlife and then ultimately your, your hunting as well. Yeah. I understand that frustration too, because as we were talking beforehand, uh, this land is attached to several thousand acres of state game lands, which is wonderful. Uh, however, I'll be walking around on the game lands, which I also utilize, and I'll be looking at things like, man, I wish I could cut those trees down <laughs> or I, this is a great opening. I could you know do this or that. And 
uh, you can't do that on the state land, and they're, they can only do so much as well with the crews that they have. So, yeah, it's fun to have my land to manage. And, of course, being at the National Deer Association, we produce a lot of videos, how-to, hands-on. So I use it, you know, if you're, if you're a member or you're a follower of the NDA, a lot of the stuff you see, especially the stuff that I'm shooting, is done right here where we're sitting. Uh, a lot of the, the video, the deer footage and so on, a lot of that was shot right here that we use at NDA. So I, I like to use it for that professionally, too. It works out well for that. So. Yeah, that's that's actually really nice to be able to do. And there's there's no better way of of talking about something than actually doing it. Yeah. You know, as far as you can create hypothetical situations on this is what I would do if I ran into this or whatever. But to be able to actually show it is yeah. is, is, is pretty cool. But no, it's it's a it's a nice place, and it was I was telling you driving in, saw a nice buck cross cross the road in front of me, and I was like, okay. And then even just, and I saw a bunch of other deer, and I was like, it's funny how deer numbers can change so much too, and and in a small uh, small distance away from different places, like we were talking about with the habitat changes. But you know that that being said, we were discussing earlier that you know overall, I think deer numbers are way better than they were you know and i know I, I don't know about this area specifically maybe it's been good for for a long time or maybe even overpopulated i'm not sure but in in my areas it's been getting better and i love love seeing it it's not like there's deer behind every tree as, as i said there's days where i'll still go without seeing deer but a lot of that has to do with the dense cover they may be there i'm just not yep, not yep. necessarily seeing them yeah, I mean, I would, I would even say, I, in this immediate area, I probably have too many deer. Uh, I wanted to shoot more does last year, didn't get it done. You know, they don't always cooperate. <laughs> so yeah. People think, oh, you should shoot more, go out and shoot more does. Well, it's not always that easy, especially I'm really focused on archery hunting, and they don't always want to cooperate with you. But um, yeah, I mean, if if you're going to put the time in and create the habitat and do the work that I've done, you also have to be willing to keep your populations in check too, because this is still. Uh, a very sort of mountainous, hilly area here. The nearest agriculture as the crow flies is probably at least two to three miles away. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, deer are really relying on the landscape here. And then I've gone and manipulated the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so they're attracted. You know, they want to be here and be part, and be in, involved in that. But you have to control it. Otherwise, it can quickly uh, get ahead of you. But so, yeah, some areas of the state, you know, that, that's another thing about Pennsylvania you know, you have some areas where people say there aren't enough deer and you got other areas where there's way, definitely way too many. And mm -hmm. it's, it's trying to find that balance, but yeah, it's a pretty good time to be a deer hunter right now. Oh yeah. yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's funny cause I've seen some arguments about, about doe numbers specifically and saying, oh, you know, Pennsylvania is great across the board. And, and I'd say for the most part, it probably is, but there's definitely those areas that are, you know, I, at least the way I feel about it and is like okay those are in check like i feel like it's a good mm -hmm. good number does can be taken but it's not it's not like you need to to go through and really do a lot of work to it now i'm no biologist i just know my areas from spending a lot of a lot of time in them but what i will say is when i've been doing these scouting camps in the spring what i'll do is i'll get permission on large chunks of timber company property that are leased out by mm -hmm. people and I've seen where there are some issues with deer numbers in those scenarios where you'll have a large chunk of land that's leased out to a, a low number of people and that they're, they may, may not, maybe they are shooting does, but are not able to manage them at the number they need to be. And my buddy that was a forester was showing me and we walked around these properties and he's like, look at, he's like, how old do you think this tree is? And I'll look at it and I'll be like, I don't know, a couple years old. And he's like, no, that's a seven, eight year old tree. Yeah. And that it was, you know, browse around these clear cuts. And I'm like, really? And it was just, it was mind blowing. And there was a, a piece of property that I actually hunt that, uh, I, that, that he manages for timber. And I was like, Hey, I said, I was, I always just joke with him whenever they they clear cut an area and be like, Oh, you know, I was just learning this spot. And even though I know it's, it's, it's good for him, but I like to, I like to mess with them. And, and I said, I said, this isn't growing back. I said, this has been, uh, you know, it's been a few years here. And I said, did you spray it again? He's like, no, that's just, he's like, the deer numbers are too high there and they're just over, over browsing it, uh, to the point. And so I started looking and I'm like, okay, now you can start to see all those little saplings that are just being browsed. And then they try to put a new shoot that comes off it and then those get browsed and it just turns into this little, you know, stumpy, brushy tree. And it's really hard where you don't have like the personal control 
mm-hmm. and make changes. So here, last year as we were getting into you know, what I would call, you start getting into, I don't want to say danger zone because that gives the wrong impression, but a time where deer are really you know, needing to, they're starting to run out of things out there. And uh, so the food plots that I have here, they exhausted themselves, you know, a few weeks sooner than what I would have liked. So you can, but I can see that. And then I know that I can go in and I can do some, you know, drop some trees, do some forest management, get some browse down to them and correct it. If you're out on these big pieces of public, you can't recognize a problem and then just go in and provide, <laughs> no. you know, more food. So uh, it's it can be a challenge. And, and it, there's also... It's not unique to Pennsylvania, definitely. I mean, we obviously work all over the country. And I can tell you, like in Florida, for example, we've been busy there trying to work with the Farm Bureau and the and the Florida Wildlife Commission. They can't even plant cotton in some of these areas because the minute it comes up, it's gone. And they're having trouble getting hunters to come there. And the ones that come there, they want to just, well, they want to shoot their buck. Mm-hmm. And so their mindset then becomes, well... If I shoot this doe right now, that, that's going to hurt. That buck could be right behind it, or I don't want to hurt my buck hunting. And the reality is the opposite is true. If you're not shooting does, that's the best way to really hurt your buck hunting. If I got a good buck around here that I'm hunting, but I got does everywhere behind every tree, I'm never going to see that deer because he doesn't need to move. Yep. And so that's an education point. And, um, you know, some people look at the exact opposite and they say, well, you need to, if you want to kill bucks, you got to have does. And that is true to an extent, but too many is, is bad for a lot of reasons. Yeah, no, I, I, the, the first time that I saw where that is a bad thing, just because I didn't have much experience in those areas, but in West Virginia, the lease that we have down there where, where I hunt in the bow only counties Mm -hmm. there, you're, you can only get one doe tag there because most of the areas aren't, don't have what this piece of property has, but there are so many does that, you know, it was it was made a rule that you have to you know get that doe tag and and yeah. fill it to to maintain your spot because it was ridiculous. But the you know the bucks they don't they don't need to they're not out searching like they are in some of the places. I mean they're still out searching, but they know where all the does are and there's does in every corner that they can go to because you can glass in some of those areas. I was I was sitting there behind the the spot and scope and I watched one buck hit four different doe groups in like a 400 yard yeah. area, just like going, going through and seeing which ones were, were ready. But it was just, it was crazy to me to, to see that. And that's why I've always thought that, you know, where, where I've hunted in, in PA that the buck, the doe ratio has been pretty good and that causes them to roam and to be searching more and to 100%. making the rut str- stronger, at least appealing stronger to, to you as a hunter to be able to see them moving and seeking more. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's just it. And for me, I used to feel like I was a rut hunter and I loved the rut, but the opposite is that that is true now Yeah, (laughs) because you just have no control over anything. I understand why people love to hunt the rut because especially if you're someone who didn't have a lot of time to put in the the scouting and get Mm -hmm. your, you know, your setups and, and, and have a lot of time to hunt, that's your best chance to get lucky. But your chance to get lucky gets a lot lower when that deer doesn't have to move a whole lot. But uh, I've hunted those bow only counties in West Virginia before, and I don't think I've walked the same since. <laughs> yeah. You want to talk about mountains? <laughs> yeah. I mean, those babies are straight up. So yeah, no, that's that's so true. So this this place you have here, it uh, you said you've owned it for three years. What are what's some work that you've kind of prioritized? on it to, to begin with. I know all properties are different, but just for your property specifically. Yeah. So we had a lot of uh, opening, natural openings that were here, either from the stripping or abandoned gas wells or a couple of those here and uh, very little grows on them. So what I had was a lot of just sort of unfavorable, you know, not just for deer, but all wildlife, you know, it would be the type of vegetation that might grow to a certain height, but not quite high enough to really hide wildlife and wasn't providing any food value. So that was that was easy, sort of low-hanging fruit, working immediately to try to improve the soils, get things planted in them. And now um, one of my proudest moments is when I see deer coming out and using these plots that used to be wastelands. I'm like, you know, I did that. You know, that, was, yeah. that was blood, sweat, and tears. And even, you know, people can't see it here, but out, out in front of us here, out in front of the cabin, is a, right now it's a beautiful knee-high clover plot. And uh, it's loaded with deer and other things that use it now. But before it wasn't like that. It was a lot of pine trees that on these old strip 
strip, sometimes they'll, you know, to your point about a tree that's three foot tall and seven years old, well, that's what grows a lot of times on strip mine. Mm-hmm. So uh, my dad and I come through and he has a little tractor and we were able to remove a bunch of those and enhance the openings. So that was probably the lowest hanging fruit. And then timber management and do a lot with chainsaws, especially in the winter months, trying to uh, open up. I do have some oaks, which is nice and mm-hmm. get them opened up the young oaks so that they can thrive and improve mass species. And, um, you know, that, that really was sort of, that never ends. None of this work ever ends. No. But that was, that was where the focus was. Things, things that you can't do, you can't change the layout of the land. So if you're looking for land, you know, find those places that have natural uh, edges due to the elevation changes and water is good. I have a stream that runs on the east border of the property, which is good. So you have that. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't really change that, but the things you can change, I think those two areas were probably the the biggest focus yeah no i noticed the the oak trees when i pulled in even here right by your camp yeah there's at least one i think i saw that was there and and uh and and that's a good point as far as the the layout of it because you know if you buy something that's completely flat it's always going to be flat and if if that's what you want then that's fine but just (laughs) you're not going to create a mountain you know (laughs) yeah and you know get to know your neighbors i always say like you don't ever want to own land next to the guy that's got you know, 15 Pope and Young's hanging on this wall, right? <laughs> yeah. Like those are the guys that are, or the, if you're a turkey hunter, you don't want the guy that's driving around with 20 beards hanging off of his uh, rear view mirror, you know? Spur necklace. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> it's pretty quiet out here. We have, uh, there's a, a bit of an Amish community here um, that, uh, you know, you get to know and they, they certainly hunt as well, but, um, you know, it's, it's that, that helps too. So you got to know what's going on around you. Yeah. How's the hunting been so far? Like last season and everything as you've been? Yeah. The hunting's great. The hunter is probably not so good. <laughs> um, I've, I've had the, the fortune throughout my lifetime and career to hunt all over the country. Uh, but I grew up here in Pennsylvania and uh, have lived other than a, a handful of years, you know, between North Dakota and Ohio, I've lived most of my life here. Um, hunting here is has always been the most challenging. And so I know you have a lot of Pennsylvania listeners and they're nodding their head right now saying, yeah, I've always said that. It's not just me. Yeah. And it's not just you. You know this. Um, when you're trying to kill a mature buck or an older turkey or whatever in this part of the world, it's hard. And so uh, I was talking about a deer I was hunting last year, showed you a video of you know, him walking right by the cabin. Um, you know, that's a deer that I only glimpsed twice all last year, even though I probably have close to a thousand trail camera pictures of them. Yeah. So the hunting itself, that's really good. The getting is is tough. Well, and I'm sure as, as you learn the property more and kind of find those, those sweet spots and those seams that, you know, that deer likes to hang out. And then other times it's just mature deer are just hard to kill. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and I've killed two mature deer here uh, the first two years. And then uh, last year I was focused on one particular deer. It's not that I couldn't have shot a nice deer. Yeah. And so that should be, you know, part of the conversation too. Yeah. It's that if you're setting your standards at a certain level, that makes it harder too. And yeah. so I'm out there mostly with a bow trying to hunt the oldest deer. I mean, you know this, your listeners that, uh, you know, most of your listeners are that same way. Yeah. We, we make it harder on ourselves, but that's cool too. I don't, I don't mind. I don't feel like I lose if I don't get them. I think it's really cool that I know that that deer is still out here walking around. You yeah. Know, and I saw him in turkey season. I'm pretty sure it was him. It's hard to tell when they're just starting to grow. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, that's just as much fun. No, that that is super exciting. It's it is hard to we were talking a little bit before that and I'm like I'm just I'm not at a point where and I've mentioned on the podcast before but where I where I'm like one deer or nothing and that could change who knows, you know, yeah. my my emotions can go uh go wild for certain deer but uh it I I do like to target specific deer and then kind of having goals with age classes and everything and last year was one of those those times where it was like there was deer that you know i let walk that i would have been normally more than happy to to shoot but when you start setting your goals higher it becomes tougher and you got it you got to be okay with that if yeah. that's if that's what you're going to do going into it because it was it, it made me mentally go uh, a little bit crazy and you know it's like I, I had someone tell me they're like well are you, aren't you taking the fun out of deer hunting and i'm like for me that is part of the fun even though that i may you know yeah get stressed at times or get down about it it's like that's to me when i look at it like i i do like it i like that aspect of it 
Yeah, I mean, I, I recently wrote an article for NDA. It was called uh, "Targeting Mature Bucks as a Lonely Road," <laughs> and it really is. It is. I mean, I I was this was in Delaware where I also hunt a fair amount uh, with my friend Ron there, but uh, this was in the winter season. Now we're like after Christmas, right? And the deer have been chased and all that, and I'm I'm coming out and I stepped out on the road and I'm looking down this big long dirt road, and that just occurred. It's like it's so lonely. I saw a whole bunch of deer that morning, but I didn't see one I wanted to, to shoot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, it, we make it harder on ourselves, but that's kind of the fun of it too. Yeah. And it's not, I, I went through the stage. I mean, you're, you're coming into this, you're quite a bit younger than I am. So when I was your age, people were still pretty much just shooting anything. And I've got a big basket of racks at home to show that, you know, yeah. I was one of those people. It was, it was about that I get my buck and it wasn't had nothing to do with anything. And and that's totally still cool. I got no problem with that. Um, you know, people should shoot what they want. But for me, as I started to, to hunt differently, it became less about, and even to this day, it's not really about the score of the antlers as much as I'm, I would really like here to be shooting four or five year old deer and then, you know, beyond if you can find them. And, um, it's just a different challenge. And you, if you're going to do that, you have to be willing to accept that it's not going to go well most times. Mm-hmm. And But that's cool. I mean, you just see so much. I could have shot a really nice nine-pointer here in the gun season that I let walk. And uh, I just sort of chuckled to myself because I thought, you know, that the 25-year-old Nick Pinazada would have been filled dressing a deer right now. The, <laughs> the, the, the 50-year-old one uh, is just sort of smiling that I got to see that deer in the middle of the you know, the middle of gun season, just feeding along. And that was pretty cool. But yeah, so your it changed your motivation will change. Oh yeah. No. And it, and yeah. And that to me, it's like, it, I want to make it to where it's, it's challenging and also that I have fun doing it. And, and for me, I like the scouting and, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's probably with you too, like the land management side of it and those aspects of it just as much, if not more than actually, the the hunt itself or the, or or the harvest of the the animal because like it's just I, I like that that whole process and I like visualizing what I think you know could happen or what's going to happen and you know sometimes even if I'm not hunting a spot and I'm like oh you know you, you make these you make these thoughts in your head especially on newer places like I you know this looks like it would be good this time of year maybe you're not hunting it but your trail camera shows that that actually panned out that way and you're like that's, that's a win to me. That's, that's, you know, just another thing that you've learned and, and part of the experience. Yeah. And you've inspired me. I mean, you can, you know, like I said, you're quite a bit younger, but then I'm listening to your show. This is before we'd ever even you know, exchanged information. And, uh, you know, I'm listening like, man, this is, this is fun. This is exciting. It's different to go yeah. out. And that's, I mentioned being tied to a, you know, a bunch of game lands here. And so I've gone out and learned those too, and and do the listen to what you say and the things that you do, and, you, and your dad and others you've had on, and try to implement those things, and have found nice deer, and yeah. So it's nice to have your own place, but I also I want to know all of it. Like I want to know what's going on on this hillside and yeah. that hillside. So yeah, it's it's fun. You got to make the whole. You got to love the process. If it's yeah, you know, I, I coach baseball for a long time. I always tell the guys, listen, you better love. Th- the game you better love to practice because 90 percent of the time that's all you're doing yeah the game itself is a very small part of it and that's the way it is with deer hunting if you want to do it the way we're doing it you better love the process because if it's just about punching tags all the time that's the lonely road right <laughs> that's that's exactly right yeah. and uh yeah it's that i actually read that article that that you wrote there i was like man this is i think there's a lot of people that can relate yeah. <laughs> relate to that and uh and there's also this thing i've learned with with deer hunters you know if you look online or on social media you don't see all of that you typically just see people's successes and it, you know it's like holy cow everyone else is doing you know good except for me and then when you get like one-on-one with somebody you're like all right we're all in the same that's right <laughs> the same camp here it's miserable yeah. yeah yeah i mean what did what did i read in um i read this in the nda's deer report uh about there was in out of all deer hunters only 41 percent that fill tags and you know that's that was, I would have thought that number would be higher. You know, just, that's just a tag, a yep. deer tag. 41% not. shoot one and only 17% shoot more than one. And so, yeah, I mean, last year I shot three, which is less than I normally shoot. Mm-hmm. 
and I felt like a big failure. But then when you get to the point where someone shot more than two, you're getting into the, like single digits of percent. But yeah, less than half the people uh, across the country that, that are pursuing a deer actually shoot one. Wow. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. No, it really is. I love that that deer report, by the way. I geek out on it. I know like a few years ago we covered we covered some stuff on the podcast when you came on before about it, but I love reading that. I love looking at those. And uh, now after something we'll talk about here later, I under I understand how states get data and how they make Oh yeah. um so, I guess as far as when they don't have all the data, how they make the inferences and how they predict kind of to, to be able to manage some of the numbers and the wildlife and understand those statistics. And like it, it, uh, it makes me, you know, reading the report even better because for a while there I was helping out Spartan Forge with their deer data and I was doing the research from the states and pulling it in to put it into the app. And, and I was like, man, so many states, it's really difficult to to find data. And then there's other states that do really well with it. Yep. So it's 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 tough to put together a report like that, but it's, it's extremely valuable to, to be able to read. And I, you know, you can find that on, on the deer association.com website to, to be able to go look at it and highly recommend it. Yeah. I appreciate that. And the, the team does a tremendous job. I wish I could take some credit for it, but <laughs> the reality is like Kip Adams and his team, Matt Ross and others there, Ben Westfall, they do all the hard work. All they show me in the end is, hey, here's our recommendations. Like, make sure we stay out of trouble. That's the only part I, I really get to participate in. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and not only do some states, most states are pretty good about giving you their data. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few that aren't. Uh, but then a lot of them, collect, they collect it differently. It's not uniformly collected. So, you know, how a state licenses and how they sell tags. And so uh, our team has to take all that and try to collate it and get it all into a nice, neat report so that hunters like yourself or uh, state wildlife agencies like it as well, because there's so much good data in there. So yeah, I appreciate the plug and uh, that's yeah. a free resource. Yeah. Yeah. I, so like when you're planning, you know, if you, especially if you're planning like an out of state trip or something to be able to look at, there's some good statistics in there, you know, whether it's, you know, bucks per square mile that hunters are, are killing or just like regular data as far as deer numbers and everything like there's a lot of data in there that you can use to help find some places that maybe aren't uh you know spotlighted as far as your your typical states that you would go go check out and i like i like being able to find some of that stuff and because one thing that i've that i've come to learn is there's there's really good hunting in in most places it's just trying to find those those places now obviously there's the there's more you know, big bucks in the Iowas and the Kansas sure, of the right. world, but you can find mature deer and, and, and find the hunting experience you're looking for in a lot of places. Yeah. I mean, if the four or five year old deer here where there's not a, an actual farm or anything within a couple miles, uh, you know, if you could get 140, a really big one would be 150. Well, that's a three-year-old in a lot, a lot of places in yeah. Iowa. Yeah. And it doesn't make it a less deer. I mean, no. like I said, I've, I've shot some, you know, deer in the 150s and better, and some of the hunts were pretty easy compared to trying to chase a 130 here, right? Yeah. So it's just all in, you know, different different areas, different quality. You got to know where, what the high water mark is and yeah. and set your goals accordingly. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm really interested. By the time this comes out here, I'm assuming that, or right around that time, Iowa draws should come out. And if I draw that tag, everyone I talk to, because I've never hunted Iowa, they're like, you're going to, it's, it's going to be an interesting it's going to be interesting for you to to go out there and 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 play around, I guess, because you know what I'm going to think is a you know a big deer may not be, and it's going to be difficult as far as looking at that kind of stuff. Yeah, it. Uh, well, good luck. I'm, I hope you draw. I'll be yeah. watching to see. But uh, I was just in Iowa three weeks ago now mm -hmm. uh, with a couple of different landowners who uh, we're working with there, and. Um, you know, the one we're, we're walking down, he's like, yeah, and this is where I missed that one that ended up scoring like 180. And then this is where this one was 200. And yeah, so they just, it's different there. A, one, a 150 out there may get a pass because it's a, you know, yeah. a three-year-old. And, uh, but, you know, also, there are also people like 
that, that are happy to shoot any deer they see. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, again, it's just, it's all in what you're looking for. But Iowa, Kansas, Illinois. Yep. I mean, they, there's a reason that those states come up when you're talking about big deer. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's definitely true. Yep. But I kind of want to transition a little bit here, Nick, to uh, not as fun of a, a, a topic, or maybe it is, but as far as something that got a little bit of controversy here recently on the podcast where I brought up, um, where I talked to, to two women, two women, Jennifer and Becca, about about the Saturday deer opener and some controversy there, and and uh, you reached out to me off of that and and wanted to share some data that was you know kind of opposing what what we were looking at and that is in support of the other side of when I say other side, I don't mean as far as separating it, but in in support of the Saturday opener and also give what you gave me some education on is how, how surveys are sent out Mm -hmm. and, um, and then how they're conducted, especially with the, the, the specific agencies that, that was, that were used from the States and that you guys use at NDA. So yeah, wanted to talk about that a little bit. And I, and I, before, before I, uh, let you talk on that. I just want to wanted to say, you know, for the most part, there were a lot of really good dis- discussions that that came out of it, and people that reached out to me directly that were even opposing to my thought process. We we were able to to come to really g- had really good conversations. I learned a lot from them. You know, they had said they'd learned they completely understood where I was coming from with it, but this is why they felt that way, and like that was super educational for me to 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 be able to have those conversations now some of them didn't none of the ones that were directly like messaged towards me were negative at all mm-hmm. it was just some of the public ones that you know were yeah. spiraling down some some bad <laughs> some bad roads there but uh yeah it was it was uh it was pretty interesting but i i do have to say first and foremost that you know me talking about something giving an opinion on how i feel about it is not a ploy for anything bigger. I'm not a part of any coalitions or, or against anything. You know, I, someone has said, "Oh, you know, you must be against the game commission." And I, I didn't. I did not think I sounded that way at all. And it's funny. I'm actually meeting with them here tomorrow to do a podcast. So, like on on theirs, I'm like that is the opposite of how I how I feel. It was just talking about a, a specific topic that was, uh, you know, definitely get some people worked up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think that was the first thing I said to you is, man, Bo, you really must have been looking to <laughs> yeah. stir up some trouble there. But, yeah. uh, you know, I think um, I think a few things. I think one, the passion for tradition and the passion for deer hunting is really awesome. To me, that is, that's far better than if we were involved in something that just nobody cared about. You know, oh, the checkers tournament is you know, next weekend and six people care about it. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Pennsylvania, um, you know, I've seen this my whole life is even before I was a hunter, I was a hunter in my mind, you know, and the passion and this neighbor thinks this way and that neighbor thinks that way. And uh, deer, and it's not just Pennsylvania, there's so many other states across the country there, they can be a lightning rod and good and bad. I mean, I think it's good that people are passionate about deer. That means that we'll have a good hunting tradition and people will care about them and they should. Uh, sometimes it goes too far. Um, rarely would you ever have somebody that actually was speaking to you like I am yeah. come at you the way they might come at you on the comments. And that's always going to be there, and that's fine too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, just specifically the topic. So I, I'm qualified to talk about this as someone that's been hunting deer in Pennsylvania for, you know, before too long here, it'll be 40 years. Let that sink in. Yeah. So <laughs> I started yourself. hunting when I was like 12. <laughs> Uh, I'm 50 now, so, you know, we're getting up there. Yeah, And I've seen it all. And for me growing up, it was always, uh, my uncle would come, uh, he lived in the Philadelphia area, he would come the day after Thanksgiving, spend those few days, we'd go out and pick our spots, you know, and then uh, and then we would hunt Monday. And so, and then you would get school off, and I loved that. I still love that. You know, I think that's one of the... Maybe one of the tragedies is the kids lost a day they could get off of school uh, in this in this area. All the schools always would take off Monday, you know, the first yep. day of buck. We 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 that's what we call it the first day of buck, and uh, so that was the tradition I had growing up. And then of course that changes as I got older. Um, 
you know, other when I'm traveling for work or whatever, I have more of a flexible schedule. Uh, to me, it doesn't really matter if the opening day, if I'm not a big firearms hunter, I still do it, but it never, it doesn't really matter if it's Saturday or Monday to me. Um, but I can certainly see why it matters to a bunch of people and your guests were the same way. I mean, it was really great to see. I loved hearing their stories about, you know, how, first of all, how they got it sort of initiated and allowed to come to camp. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I thought that was they just, they told that story so well and be able to be able to see the video of it. Um, was pretty neat. And they, they did a great job representing, you know, their, their part of it. And that's good. I and mean, I thought it was great for you to have them on. And they're not wrong. And that's the thing is nobody's really wrong. Uh, they said something uh, about, uh, I forget which one it was. Uh, she had mentioned, though, about sort of the, the biological impact of when the opener is. And yeah, there is from a, from a, a national deer association perspective. That's the, that's the only thing we really care about. Not only thing, but it's one of the biggest things. If, if changing when you shoot the deer has a big impact, a big negative impact on the population, you know, we would have something to say about that. Yeah. Uh, but here specifically in Pennsylvania, whether they open the season on the Saturday or whether they open it on a Monday biologically doesn't really make any difference. And so we don't have a horse in the game, you know, in the race on that one. Um, but then you know, I know we've certainly frustrated some folks though, who, you know, we have members in PA that very much want to keep the opener on the Monday and they're upset that we didn't come out and, and oppose the change. Well, we didn't oppose the change largely driven by the polling. Again, we don't have a horse in the race in terms of, you know, whether it's Monday or Saturday, mm -hmm. um, biologically, but the polling was so clear and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, the, the first thing is responsive management did the work. I mean, I can tell you that states all across the country use responsive management. They use that company. They use a, a company called Southwick and Associates because they are top notch in what they do. They are experts in polling. And so, number one, I know it's credible. The polling's credible. And, you know, it's it's not. And it's also not that it's just 60% that were polled favor it being on Saturday. There's also, there's a, there's like a, if you, if you add up everybody that said they wanted it on to keep it on Monday and gave the, gave that group all of the middle that were just didn't care either way, they still were well behind the group that wanted to have it on Saturday. And the Saturday reasons were obvious. It's, um, they have an opportunity to take kids, more opportunity to be in the outdoors. Um, not everybody could get off work to go on Monday. And of course the folks especially the people that have camps and so on and have that tradition. Um, I can see why they said, well, we love having it on Monday because we can go up and spend all this great camp time. And I, I love that. It's, that's mm -hmm. awesome. And so now it's created this issue. So our position on it is only just simply based on the polling. If, uh, if, so, if, if a credible pollster did it again, uh, you know, every, if they did it every year and all of a sudden it swung the other way, we'd say, well, and it should, Let's go with whatever the most people want, right? Yeah. It's, it's tough. Like I said, nobody's really wrong. It's just yeah. people come at it from different perspectives. No, and, and and I think one of the important things is what you had said. You know, first and foremost, it comes down to the you know the wildlife. Does this have an impact? No, right. then like that because that's what NDA's stance and how kind of right. you guys look at things and how how does that impact you know positive, negative, or indifferent when it comes to deer yeah we have some states where people will come to us and say we need to move our gun season out of the rut and we say well i mean that's not really for us to really get into or get involved with but um because biologically that's where we want to see is it is it really impacting the deer herd negatively one yep. way or another um and so in pennsylvania i get wrapped into it a little bit more because i happen to live here as does kip adams you know one of yeah. our most visible people and so him and I get it a little bit more because we're here. Um, but, you know, Kip would tell you the same thing. It's like we personally, like it doesn't matter to us. We we would just like to see most people get what they want. I mean, yeah. that, that just makes sense, right? I mean, that's how a lot of things, unfortunately, are decided. Um, but it's not like the NDA doesn't have like a position on it. It should be this day or it should be that day. But if the polling just says this is what it should be, that's what we go with. And then I think there's also... Uh, this is what I'd messaged you about. I think there's just some confusion about what polling is. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest place we hear about polling is like when there's a presidential election, right? We just get sick of hearing about the polling. Um, the reality is 
not everybody can be an expert in statistics. I'm not an expert. I understand how it works. You know, I had to do a bunch of statistics in my master's work. I hated it. <laughs> um, but at least the upside of that was I understand how it works. And so, you know, if our, if our sample size, if our population that we're sampling was 100 people, then you should sample all 100 because it's a small, small sample size. But you never want to sample more than 10% of what your entire population is you know, up to a thousand and people are like, well, how can that be? Like, how could you sample a thousand people and get an accurate result? And it's, and it's scary accurate, you know, all uh, statistics show that once you get above a thousand, you're not changing your result. And also it's important that the people doing the polling are doing a, a, a poll across the, a wide region, which is what was done here. That's why you got to have a credible pollster mm-hmm. uh, to do that work. And so, um, really, uh, responsive management could have done it with a thousand. They actually went, they doubled that. They did it over 2000 people and they did a phone survey. And so 2000 people were surveyed. My guess is if they looked at the first thousand, their result would have been almost exactly the same as what they got after 2000. So once you get reach a certain threshold, it doesn't matter anymore. You're going to largely get the same result within a, you know, a typically a 2% margin of error. And so, it's complicated, and I understand yeah. that. And and, I, and one of your guests said, and, and I understand why she feels this well. Nobody called me, and nobody talked to my friends. Well, nobody talked to me or my friends either, you know, that I know of. And so, but you look at the giant population of Pennsylvania, the chances that you or even someone you know might get the call are not good. You know, it's mm-hmm. not it's not unlikely that you'll get polled. Uh, I don't think I've even ever been officially polled for like an election. You know type thing which you would expect that you that you would be yeah and so it's very it's confusing i could see why someone you know that doesn't deal with statistics all the time would say well how could they talk to a thousand people when you know no one in my neighborhood feels that way well you know you can't make that assumption first of all and second of all i mean it's just that's how statistics work yeah no that's that's it's i mean it's still hard to wrap my head around of of understanding out of you know how many people are out there and, you know, 2000 can, but I, but I, I do understand the fact that, especially when I spent more time, you know, from your direction and looking through the report on where it was broken up as far as the age demographic mm-hmm. is, as far as male or female, um, the regions that they hunt, those things and tried, and it was a pretty even split on the people that were pulled across there. So that, that was something that I definitely overlooked to when I had first first looked at it and and helped me understand that, which makes a little bit more sense. It's different, you know. I was I was telling you I did a um, a poll through my audience of just just I well this, the funny story I'll just tell you real quick. That, so I was like, how do I make a survey? You know, <laughs> so I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll what use could this. go wrong? I was like, I'll do Survey Monkey and I'll and I'll you know I'm like, oh man, they got a free plan. That's nice. So I uh, I signed up and and built this poll based off of some of the parameters that were were in the responsive management one and and uh sent it out. We we'll realized that my free trial is only for twenty five people. So I oh, ended no. up spending, I don't know, hundred and ten dollars to get the results. And I'm like, well I did it. I have to get the results to 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 be able to get it. And um some of the some of the poll you know, it was a very a lot smaller of a group size. I just sent it out in email. I think there was 140 or 144. I think I told you 148 earlier, but 144 uh, people that had responded to it, and it was 50 percent in favor of Saturday, 44 percent um, in favor of Monday, and six percent that that didn't care. But the age demographic there was not, it wasn't very widespread. There was I think I think I written down 60. 69% have oh, 69 percent have children, um, 48% were in the 25 to 34 age class, and every single one was male that <laughs> responded to it. Well, that's my audience. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's that's what I had seen there. But but what I thought was, was cool with that survey was just that most, you know, most, the majority of the open-ended responses that I put in there think that the, the Sunday hunting and a Sunday, you know, or, and, or a Sunday opener would be a good compromise that went through it. Now, like, I, I don't know. I I go back and forth on, this isn't, this isn't a hill I'm willing to die on. So I'm not, I'm not sitting here trying to, uh, to oppose it 
extremely, you know, I, I do still feel a, a certain way for me personally, but I understand if the majority wants a, a, a certain way, which it looks like from the numbers, that's kind of the, the way it is that, um, you know, it's not a hill I'm willing to die on and probably should have, you know, I've, I've been an advocate of Sunday hunting for a while, which I know NDA is also Absolutely. on that, on yeah. that side. And, you know, that, cause I got some questions like, oh, you should have been promoting Sunday hunting. I'm like, well, I've done podcasts on it. Looking at it, it's been like four years since I've really talked about it specifically as a topic. And although it's been sprinkled in episodes, I know not everyone's listening to all sure, of them. Exactly. And every time, it, you know, Bill comes up, I'm contacting you know, I'm, I'm contacting people. I'm following the, uh, I'm trying to do my part, but not, I, it, it was maybe a little bit out of order of how I was looking at things. And that's what you learn from, from, uh, tackling controversial topics here. But well, you're just, you're just trying to have a show and entertain people and get opinions out. Yeah. Of it. So you're not trying to have to think about all of that stuff and, um, which is fine. And I think, um, you know, the, that's the majority of the people were coming here to be entertained and so on. And when you do hit a sensitive topic, then you see the reaction, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, if, if the game commission came out tomorrow and said this year, we're going to start on Monday. Like I'd be like, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the people that wanted Monday will love it. And if they say, well, it's going to be Saturday because, you know, most people said it's Saturday. Then I'd say, well, that's great. You know, more people will have opportunity. And so, you know, to your point, it's about opportunity. Like I, I've, I Sunday hunting would, I don't want to say it's solved. There'll, there'll, there'll be people that don't like Sunday hunting. We oh, know yeah. that. You know, yeah. it's the, believe it or not. You know, even though the, the the ten people in my circle, the first ten people I talked to, if I said, um, you know, Sunday hunting, they'd be like, yeah, we need to have it. And I, that doesn't mean though that a hundred percent of the people like it. And even like surveying your audience, that's a biased sample. You know, that's a whole other statistical thing to talk about because there's a certain people that listen to your show, right? Yeah. That are, have a certain mindset. Um, I could paint a picture right here of what my typical listener looks like. You know, like there's there's exactly. <laughs> you know, you're looking at one right yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but Sunday hunting one is an easy one for us to get behind because it's more opportunity. Um, it's we're closer now, I think, than we've ever been. There's some really, you know, there's some really positive momentum moving forward now on Sunday hunting, and so yeah, I mean, every everybody, unless you're somebody that just opposes it, um, you know, for whatever reason, everybody that's behind it needs to really push now and, and contact their legislators and say this is it's time. We really need to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I don't know, it was probably two or three weeks ago, I would sent another email out. Um, I think, I don't remember which um, or which organization was, was I think it might have been BHA that was helping out with some some things that were around there that, mm -hmm. that uh, or I saw the call to action based off of that. Because it does help when, when you know, when you guys and other organizations bring that stuff to light because everyone is so busy and it's difficult to see when bills are, you know, coming on the table and things that are going on. I mean, as involved as I am, I miss things all the time that I'm like, man, I should have really known about this or. Yeah. I mean, we have full-time policy people that yeah. are looking at this all the time. Right. And then I'm, I spend an awful lot of my time doing policy stuff. It's not the fun stuff, no. <laughs> uh, but, but you have to do it so that the average hunter out there can be focused on, you know, where to hang my tree stand and where to plant my food plot and all that stuff, because that's the fun stuff. That's what people should focus on. But um, yeah, I mean, now, now is the time to be pushing. There, there's a lot of, um, it's a favorable environment, I think, for this to happen. And, um, like I said, of, of all the times that this has been sort of on the table, off the table, I think we're closer now than we've ever been. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's funny when we talk about more opportunity, the one thing that, that I struggle personally with a line of how, and I, it sounds crazy to say, but how much is too much opportunity as far as like, you know, Obviously, more opportunity would mean a month long gun season, but that would that would probably come down to definitely an impact on on the deer. Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know that answer personally. I you know, two weeks for me is 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 fine, but that's I know there's other people. There was people that were like, oh, I'd rather it, you know if it opened Monday, go for three you know three weeks and and have that. And personally, I don't love that idea, but. I, I don't know what the impact is of something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not always just about opportunity either. Like you, you could give some people, some hunters, we all know them. You could give them all year to fill their tags and they won't. Mm -hmm. They might fill one, 
and it'd be like, you know what, I'm going to get real lazy about my hunting. Oh, next thing you know, the year's up. And so even in some of these states that allow, I mean, this will shock Pennsylvanians listen to this, but states that allow like four or five bucks, four or five bu- people's heads would, heads would explode around here if, <laughs> yeah. you, if you suggested something. But nobody feel, nobody shoots four or five bucks. Most, most people don't even shoot one in those states where they have the opportunity to shoot that many. And so we're looking at other barriers, especially these areas where we've got, we know we have too many deer. Like what are some other barriers that people shooting more of these deer? Is it an earlier season? Like let people go out with guns in, you know, the first week of September for a week, you know, would that help with it? Or because, you know, it's not always adding time on to the end of the year because by that time it's weather's not usually good. You're burned out from the holidays. I don't know about you, but like come January, I'm exhausted from hunting as much as I love it. Oh yeah. I need a freaking break. Yeah. And so it's not always about tacking time on to the end. And so we're, when I say we, like collectively, not just NDA, but other states are trying to figure out what are some of these barriers? How do we um, not just give people opportunity, but the right opportunity to, to help them be more successful? Yeah. You know, it's like I look at Ohio and their archery season goes from end of September through February. And I, I like Ohio's structures for how some of their seasons are set up and they have the muzzleloader season and, yep. and you know i'd love to see an, an inline season you know even if it's three days to at some point in the year i'd not you know that's and i'd love to see a longer archery season so here i am you know saying i don't want to well, see here longer. come the comments way yeah, to go Bo. yeah yeah no but like that's <laughs> this is just me talking just sure, personally sure if if Bo's world was perfect that's what you know some things yeah. that it would look like i'm not i'm not sitting here um I'm not knocking on doors trying to, to to advocate for those things, but that's just, you know, something that, that comes to mind. And, and like, as far as, you know, you talked about sometimes more opportunity isn't necessarily always the case. Do you feel like with new hunters and youth hunters, what are some things that you've seen as far as actually good for retainment? Yeah, well... I mean, the first thing is they have to have the opportunity and a chance to go. And I think that's one of, if you looked at the, you know, to get back quickly to the, to the Pennsylvania opening of gun, uh, that group of people that had young kids to introduce were really, really strong and heavy on, we love the Saturday opener. Yep. Okay. Um, I took my son just last evening on a little turkey hunt a turkey hunt in the evening, right? It was, you know, weather was good. We could set in a blind and he could play with the turkey call and put his face paint on. Um, that was a one-time thing that we did that's going to that's gonna make an impression on him. I wanted to make sure it was a you know positive experience and so on. Well, we want to make sure people get that first experience. That's mm-hmm. number one. Uh, get them the first experience. Uh, but it's not even just youth. It's also adults that have either hunted before or have never hunted. Our Field to Fork program, over 80% of those people that go through that program continue to hunt. That's retention. Yeah. And so those folks... Believe it or not, you know, there's there's someone that's 30, 40 years old that always wanted to, to hunt but never got the opportunity or never had someone show them. They come be part of Field to Fork. They love it. Well, they're also of the age where they can buy equipment and they can go find places to hunt and drive themselves there. And so I think it's just getting them that experience. It's not going to be for everybody just because I took my son you know, out to sit with me to call turkeys last night doesn't, isn't going to make him a hunter, but it was an experience. And so it's that experience and having repetitive opportunities in a world where we're busier than ever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think anyone would would argue that. Um, just it's it's just giving them this, that chance and that opportunity. Yeah, no that 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 makes sense. And and like you the, you talked about the field, the fork. That's the education aspect of it mm-hmm. to be able to because I, I see it through the podcast. There's a lot of listeners that are in that the you know, thirty to forty year old group that are newer, or they did it when they were a kid. And then, you know, whether their their camp fell apart or nobody in their in their household went out hunting anymore, that they just kinda went out of it and they're getting back into it and trying to learn. And that's a big barrier to entry, you know, probably even more so as an adult because you don't have someone there that's unless you have good friends or or education and things to be able to learn because that's that's difficult. Like I if I'd never if I never hunted before and I were to go out and really anywhere, but just get turned loose in Pennsylvania on public land and go to try to figure out how to kill a deer. That's not super simple. No. I mean, I was with a friend yesterday, uh, meeting for a coffee and, um, 
you know, he, we got to talking about, we were talking mostly about hunting. And then I mentioned about uh, fly fishing, which is something else that I love to do and, you know, do a fair amount of. And, you know, he says, I've always wanted to learn. I got, I bought some gear, but I don't know what I'm doing. I'd always like to learn. And so that for him, it was fly fishing. I'm like, well, that's easy. Get your gear together. I'll see what you have and we'll, we'll go out. You know, we'll mm-hmm. go out this summer and I'll get you started. Um, and so it's really anything that you've never done before. You might have an interest or it looks interesting, but unless there's someone to say, hey, well, let me show you. It's very hard to just walk into a store and say, well, this is all the gear I need or even watch YouTube or there's no um, substitute for actually getting out and doing it and, and hopefully having somebody to introduce you to it. So that's that's what our field to fork program is largely about. So. Yeah, no, that's I think that's that's awesome to 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 be able to have and, and do that, because, again, this is it's having the opportunity, but also being able to have a good experience with that opportunity and that, you know, that's where, you know, the quality of the experience is, is, you know, I would argue just as important or close to being as important as the opportunity standpoint. Yeah, for sure. And it, and it also, some people fall out of their chair when I say this, but it's also okay if not everybody wants to hunt. Yeah. You know, like (laughs) if my son, people make assumptions because of you know my career and so on, you know, you're getting your son out there hunting and well, you know, he, he's only shown a, a light interest in it and I'm slowly working him into it, but I'm not going to force him to do it. Um, mm-hmm. you know, he's seven and to this point hasn't shot a gun yet. Well, there are kids out there that are five that have already shot turkeys. Well, for them that worked for our situation, it hasn't worked because mm-hmm. I, for, you know, knowing, I don't think anyone knows, no one knows they're, you know, a kid better than their parent. And so when the time is right for that, then we'll graduate up to that point. I will give him the opportunity and then he'll decide. But it's okay if some people say, you know what, it's not just for me. But what what, what helps though is if people are at least empathetic to hunting and that they understand why it's important and that they understand for, you know, deer specifically, we've been really working on this at the NDA, the value of deer, not just to deer hunters, but to all wildlife. When you think about where state wildlife agencies get their money to manage wildlife, 80% of everybody who buys a hunting license is going to hunt deer. The next closest species isn't even close to half that. So deer are important. Mm-hmm. You don't have to hunt them, but we want you to understand that they're important and you have to understand why hunting them is important as well. Yeah, no, that's that that, that makes a lot of sense. And also a good point of not everybody has to hunt or no. like has to, to, to be involved with it. And then that, but understanding is the important, you know, I had a podcast with Dan Gates from the Coloradans for responsible wildlife management there a few months ago. And that was something that, you know, he'd brought up as far as when it comes down to things that are happening with wildlife. And it's, it's important for everyone to understand hunting and understand the importance and yeah. how that, how that works. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, your neighbor next door has to hunt to understand it. Yeah. And if you're really lucky, you have a, you have a camp with someone in it that doesn't really want to hunt, but loves to cook. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's the, that's, that's if the, you're really lucky. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, that's, that's something lacking at our camp. Yeah. <laughs> everyone likes to hunt. Yeah. Everyone you likes need to hunt. You need a non-hunter. In. Yeah. I got, that, that's a good, that's a good point. I'm going to start recruiting, taking applications for, for someone there. That's funny. Uh, no, but that, that, that's always something that's, that's been, especially lately have been interesting, interested in me of like trying to broaden my horizons of I'm around a lot of diehard hunters a lot of times. So like, I don't get that. I don't see that other perspective as much until really, I mean, the podcast has opened my eyes to a lot of that. I've seen different people coming into the mix and, and, and trying to, to understand it. And then also there's the, the aspect. One thing that I've always looked at from a youth standpoint was the balance between, you know, making them have a good experience from being able to see deer, shoot deer versus also having them understand the, the that it's hard and it's not, yep. but of not, you know, going out and not seeing any deer for five days and then never wanting to do it again. Yeah. Well, there are lots of ways to make it fun too. Like for my son, he loved putting the face paint on (laughs) and he loved when I gave him my glass call and he was trying to make it work, you know? And I said, don't, I said, don't worry, son. I said, I don't really know how it works either. (laughs) You know? (laughs) So, and explain to him, you know, and it was funny. I I made a a post on uh, Facebook about this. Uh, 
I'm, I'm trying to teach him that you most times you don't come home with something. And I said, well, I said, uh, we're not going to get a turkey tonight. I said, so I, we're not going to have anything to eat. And he looked at me with this serious look and he said, it's okay, daddy. He said, we have Oreos and pretzels. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, through the eyes of a seven-year-old, it's not always about seeing the game or the, yeah. we'll see a deer along the road. And you, you, most people listening to this probably agree. I still can't just drive past without stopping to look at. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a million deer. I still got to look at them all. And uh, I could show my son one and he'd be like, oh yeah. And then be like, look on to the next thing, you know? So we we also can't put our own enthusiasm and values and what's important to us and assume that that's the same for everybody because yeah. it's not. No, I, I'm definitely understanding that more and more as, as I go through it. And I think it's, I mean, I think it's important to have your own values and, and, you know, feel a certain way, but also be able to be understanding of others and that not everybody is in, in your shoes. Yeah. I mean, and that gets back to the camp life. You know, I, I love that. And yeah. I, I didn't, I never, I only had this place cause I reached the stage in life where I could do it. Yeah. Um, we, the idea of growing up and having a camp for us was like, we were just happy to have a place to go hunting. Yep. And so I can see why that crowd isn't as, you know, they would rather hunt on Saturday because it was a chance to hunt on the weekend. But I also can understand if you grew up in a camp or have a camp now, I absolutely understand why you'd love having it on Monday. Yeah. And I would too. So it's, it's just having empathy for all sides of the, of the conversation. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I, I definitely didn't understand that or not that I didn't understand, but there was, there, there's, yeah, there's definitely, you know, I, you know, I got called, I camp privilege, you know, I'm privileged oh, yeah. hunter. And I didn't, I didn't even know that was a, a thing. Apparently I don't spend much time on Facebook. I learned <laughs> afterwards, I started digging into Facebook groups and I'm like, man, this is a interesting. People thing. have a lot of opinions. There's a lot of opinions out yes. there. That's for sure. I mean, I but, wish everybody could shoot 180 inch deer every year and do it on the day they want to. And that this, the weather is perfect. And yeah. But make it happen. It's just Nick. not how it works, man. The you know? Deer Association can't do that. Yeah, well, I, I wish we could. <laughs> I mean, it's hard work. I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, people say, "Oh, you got the, the, you know, this is great." And I'm not complaining about my job at all. But I will tell you, um, it's not always easy because of the passion, mm -hmm. and you get a lot of people. No matter what, this is why we're so we are 100 percent science based when it comes to management of deer, and we don't have opinions. It's based on science. Uh, and we get people upset with us sometimes and we won't weigh in an opinion on what their opinion is on pick the topic because people are so passionate about deer. Yeah. And so it's it's impossible to keep everybody happy, uh, whether you're a, a non-government organization like us, whether you're a podcaster, you know, an, an influencer like you are, or if you're a game agency, it's it's sometimes hard to know what winning really is. <laughs> yeah. You know? Oh, man, it's... Uh... It's it's a struggle with, with podcasting, and I mean it's the same for you guys. But you know everything that that I say is is recorded. You know everything that comes out of my mouth that's yep. on here is recorded, and so you know there's a there's a positive aspect of that where you know people I feel like people can know who I am and explain it. But we're also human, and sometimes things don't come out the way that you wanted to or come out in a way that's not intended right. intended misinterpreted to. so you know. misinterpreted so that's where you know your approach with a uh, you know strictly science based as far as weighing in helps with with yep. some of that now i'm not going to go away from uh you know giving my opinions because that is a part of who i am right. and that's kind of what the, what people listen to you yeah that's yeah. part of the the podcast and i'm not going to you know steer away from certain things or talking about it but also you know I'm very understanding of different different perspectives and why people feel certain ways about things and and like I said I I did like I when I said in that that podcast I want to hear from people like I really did like I wanted to learn and I learned a lot from other people's perspectives that I didn't you know think about and there was and uh, I remember one one uh guy had messaged me and was like you know like he sent me a long message and I'm just going to paraphrase it but you know, I felt the exact same way, you know, that you did and until, you know, or it would feel the same way that you did, but, you know, having kids, you know, and gave the situation Change of mm -hmm. changing it and sports being year round now and like all these things. And it's like, it's just, it's harder. So I'm trying to take as any opportunity that I can. And I'm like, yeah, I can totally, totally see that. Yeah. It's hard. It's really hard when people 
like I said, nobody's wrong. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's, that's where it's really hard because something you may really want and you're not wrong to want that, you can't have it because more people might want, mm-hmm. and that's, I mean, that sucks for all of us. And whether yeah. we're talking hunting or it's, maybe it's politics, you know, the person that you wanted to get elected, like you're, that that's not who got elected. And so they were really upset about that. And, you know, I'd use politics cause that's all you see on everything anymore. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. It's crazy. It drives you crazy. So I read through the comments too, and just in preparation for the discussion today. And yeah, I mean, the only ones on there that are like wrong in my view are the ones that are just like, you know, fire and brimstone and like, <laughs> they're so mad. They're just mad. Yeah. You, you can't even understand what they're saying, but the I moment mean, most people are just, they're, they're passionate about their position yep. and that's fine. That's great. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that means it, at least from my perspective, that means that everyone cares about deer enough that it's like they, ha- they, it makes their fingers fire up on the keyboard and go away because it, it, it makes them have an emotion, <clears throat> excuse me, an emotion about it. Yeah. And that's <laughs> the worst yeah. thing would be for nobody to care at all. And then if nobody yeah. cares about deer, then there's no value. Yep. No, that's 100%. Yeah. So, um, one, an, another thing I wanted to, uh, to bring up here, I'm just looking at my notes, but, um, I want to talk about the, a completely different subject, but the public lands initiative, yep. uh, that NDA is, is a part of, or, or, or kind of bring into light here about what, what is the public lands initiative and you know what? Yeah. Just give me a background on that first and I'll dive into it more. Yeah. So the, the high points on that are essentially us helping the U S forest service get conservation work done in the forest. We have these giant, beautiful forests, but they need to be managed. And so it's, it's taking money that's been allocated for the management of forests and actually making it happen on the ground. And so uh, we've got a number of stewardship agreements across the country where we're going in and, and helping do things like improve access. So again, trying to help people get opportunity uh, and also then improve habitats through timber cutting, cutting and helping facilitate sales of timber and all things that the federal government just can't effectively do on their own. Mm-hmm. And so we've done this as far away as Idaho. Um, it's something that we're really proud of as an organization because from a national office perspective, one of the things that I really wanted us to do was to leave more of a physical footprint on the ground of things that we led. And so we've created a nice um, partnership with uh, private industry and then, you know, non-government like we are to actually make this work happen on the ground. So, and we're not alone. Uh, there are a number of other groups that do this. So the Rough Grouse Society uh, partners of ours uh, do a lot of this work. Mule Deer Foundation, um, just, you know, I hate to single groups up, but those are the ones we work with a ton to do that work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's being uh, a responsible helper to move our mission to the ground and actually physically make a difference that makes a difference for the forest, makes a difference for wildlife and provides opportunities for hunters. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think it's incredible. And I had, I, w- I was telling you before this, I saw that there was you know some work that was being done this coming weekend in Pennsylvania, uh, some habitat work and, and to be able to do that. And I was like, man, that sucks. It was the, the opening weekend, uh, or not opening weekend. It's the weekend of, uh, total archer challenge yep i got a a booth being set up there but it was like that's i i will definitely as as things come up you know nick you know i know you're busy with it and i'll make sure that i'm subscribed to things but let me know so i can share that with with people and 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 be a part of of doing some of that stuff especially in pennsylvania um but anywhere else but really be able to to spread some of that word because i think that's that's incredible that's something i talk about with with uh my buddy Kenny, who's a forester that manages a lot of large chunks of, of property and what they're doing and with some of the invasive species and things that, you know, the federal government doesn't necessarily have the the money or the, the time to be able to put to doing some of this work. And now some things like we talked about buckthorn, like that's a very big right uh, an expense and, and project that goes through there. But to to be able to have an impact in those ways. Cause it's, it's one thing for anybody to go out and be like, Oh, you know, this, you know, this sucks because of this, you know, but 
there's opportunities to be able to help them make an impact. That's awesome. Yeah. And, it, and, and we need to do a better job because sometimes we just want to roll up our sleeves and dive in. This will be a nice volunteer event. I should get back and say too, I knew if I mentioned groups, I was going to mess up and I sh- I, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I didn't say the National Wild Turkey Federation, who frankly were really the pioneers to do, to get this work on the ground and have taught us how to do it. So <laughs> I call it my friends at the NWTF listening to this. I didn't forget you. I just momentarily let it slip my mind. And even Trout Unlimited is, is doing some of that work, which is really cool. And, yeah. um, you know, stream riparian corridors and that's an organization I've been a member of for a long time and, and care about. And so, uh, yeah, it's, and I think people want to help. In, in this event that we're doing in the Allegheny National Forest, we've done, we just did one in Kentucky. We did one in Idaho last year. Uh, we're doing these things to, to try to show the public what we're doing, but to get them involved and to physically help actually make a difference out there. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that is, I think that is incredible. And everyone that, all the volunteers that jump in like that is, that is awesome to be able to, you know, dedicate your time to, to go and do that. As we talked about earlier, how busy everybody is, yep. it's, that, that means a lot that when, when people go and do that. Yeah, it'll be fun. I mean, I'm looking forward to, I'll personally be rolling my sleeves up, getting some work done, and that'll, it'll be a good day of work and meeting people who are passionate about wildlife and passionate about deer and hunting. And um, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a win-win 100% of the way. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm, I'm looking at doing a film in uh, 2025 that is something that I've been super passionate about is forest management in mm-hmm. in the form of you know timber cutting and, yep. and other and other methods there but that I feel like that is something that has not you know obviously you guys talk about that that type of stuff but in the grand scheme of things that's not something that I see a whole lot of media that's generated and there's still a lot of people that don't fully understand it when they look at something that's that's cut and be like oh they just took that for money yeah but doing doing a film about you know responsible forest management and and being able to do that and that's something that I'm trying to do like a very high quality film around it and bring some light to it and show areas of what what did something had been before what it has turned into because i've i've spent time in areas you know i know like there's places in pa that i've been to that they don't do any forest management that the deer numbers are not great right. and it's you know i'd go to these places and be like oh it's so vast and so far in like i'm gonna find these big bucks and no people and there was no people but there was also no deer right you know and the, the bark off trees are being you know that's what they're eating because there wasn't any brows coming up because the canopies were just shading everything that was underneath it. And it's just something I'm, and I, I just see all the benefits, you know, this year when I was turkey hunting, seeing even the, the hens nesting in those clear cuts and, and being able to, to be in there and all the different species that benefit from, from timber management. I really want to do, do something and, and hopefully have an impact with it. You know, Western North Carolina is one of those examples um, my business partner, Jason and Timber Ninja that lives down there, he, you know, a lot of the areas there, they're, it's very against, yeah. uh, timber cutting. And it's like, you find pockets of deer in places because it's so it's, there's not anything for them to browse on. Yeah. There's acorns a little bit of the year, but that's not, that makes up such a small percentage of their, their diet. And that's just something that's, I'm super passionate about. Yeah, I think that'd be great because the general public, they're confused, right? And so, and if you do that, you should, you should talk to our Matt Ross, who is manages our, our, uh, our work that I was describing there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he spends an awful lot of time on it. Um, and so we've, we've, we've had these slogans like the best time to plant a tree is like any time or yesterday, but we never say when's the best time to cut a tree because that was also yesterday. <laughs> and so we still have this general mindset where people see a tree fall and they immediately go to deforestation of the early late 1800s, early 1900s. And the, they cut down all the redwoods and the, they always go right to the disaster and they don't understand what early successional habitat is and why it's important to get sunlight to the forest floor and all of the different species that it benefits. I mean, I can tell you, you know, people get mad at predators and all this stuff and I just, they just misunderstand it. It's about habitat. You know, right here, I've got coyotes. I've got bobcats. I've got bears. If we took a walk up the road, we'd see 20 rabbits. Okay. I got rough grouse. I've got deer. I have all the predators. I've got all the the game that we're hunting, and you know what? They're 
getting along just fine because they have habitat. Yeah. And so that's what we need to teach people. And part of habitat is uh, tree cutting. Uh, there is a place in this world absolutely for old growth forests, and there are some species that need old growth forests. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of places that are, you know, it's sort of like wildlife deserts that have happened because there's been lack of cutting or lack of fire or whatever. So I think yeah. that would be an outstanding project. Yeah, I'll, no, I'll definitely reach out to you guys, and that was the plan of when I'm planning this out. And, and yeah. Matt's actually a forester too, so, you know, you get that perspective. Awesome, yeah. yeah. that's And what I think is cool is, like, seeing, you know, people like Matt and then and my buddy Kenny, some of the the younger generations of, of foresters coming through are doing better at explaining some of that. You know, Kenny will say it, did that, you know, he's been in a family of, of foresters for a while. And, you know, it wasn't always the the case where they felt the need to educate other people right. on it. It was just, this is what we're doing. And that was it. Now it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. And I really want to, want to, want to talk about that more and, and explain that because I, as an educational piece for hunters and non hunters to, you know, whether non hunters watch it or not, I don't know, but to have a resource to be able to point somebody to from having a discussion on it, anything like that, I think is, is, is important. So yeah, even hunters, I mean, there are hunters that don't want to cut trees either. And it's mm-hmm. like the same, like they don't want to shoot does or they, and it's, I think it's just a lack of education. And so from your you know, the platform that you come from, I think that would be a great place to, to do that for you. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. No, that is, um, I'm excited about it. So just got to figure out all that stuff and figure out how to, how to make the, the funding and everything happen. Yep. That's always the fun part that the behind the scenes of doing something like that, you know, it's so the video part of it's easy. It's doing, it's all the business behind the video. Yeah. Um, I had a fortune of my friend, Jason Matzinger, uh, in the high country he lives in Montana and he produced project elk. And I uh, had the fortune of being part of that, but also the behind the scenes and seeing how, what he went through to raise the money and piece it together. And yeah, yeah these, these, uh, these, uh, things don't just happen. <laughs> There's a oh. lot of work behind the scenes. Oh, I've talked to Jason about that before. I, Jason's one of those people I look up to as oh, far yeah. as like, I think he does a phenomenal job for, for conservation and just, and yep. just in general, I think he's a great spokesman for, for hunters and, and sportsmen and women. Like, I think he's he's top notch. Yeah. Well, you guys remind me of each other. So I've spent time like this yeah. with him and with you. Oh, that's, that's good. You're a younger version of him. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell him he said he's, that. He's almost as old as I am. <laughs> no, I just, I actually, I'm going to see Jason here in a few weeks, I believe when I go out oh, to Bo- good. Bozeman. So that, yeah. that'll be good. I, I like him a lot, but, um, well, cool. I, I think that kind of covers the things that, that I want to talk about here. Is there anything else that you can think of or anything you want to, want to bring up? No, I don't think so. I mean, appreciate always appreciate the opportunity to to be. I haven't. It's been a while since I've been on, but um, it's always good to do it. So thank thank you for that and yeah. stopping by. And um, yeah, I just I would encourage people to just you know, the empathy thing for me is a big one. You know, like for me, I I, I wish we could make everybody a hundred percent happy. And so just, uh, you know, people love hunting, and I think that's the common thread. They love deer. They love hunting, and I think that you could take. I mean, I've seen it. You can take people on the complete opposite sides of the political spectrum or whatever, and if they're they're hunters and you put them around the campfire together with a you know a beer in their hand, it, all those walls are down. Yeah. And so we all we all often want the same kind of things, and so you know just ask people to keep keep that in mind. Yes, I I would uh, echo that. So yep. No, thank you so much, Nick, and everyone. I'd recommend heading over to the Deer Association website and become a member and uh and then follow along any of the places social media youtube that put out a lot of educational stuff um also have some some really cool courses on yep. the nda website Do you want to mention those yeah our quick? deer steward program uh well, well you can actually you can go all the way to deer hunting 101 we start yeah. there you can do that um and once you become you know crazy addicted like most of us you can get into our into our deer steward programs um, this year we have a really cool module in South Carolina. We're going to show people how to set up their hunting property. People have asked for that. Uh, we do the, the habitat modules where we teach people how to do forest management and food plots and so on. Uh, our, our deer stewards one and two just teach you everything from the very basics of deer biology all the way up to measuring fetuses and determining when a deer was bred. 
Uh, so those are all courses and things that you can get through the National Deer Association. They're certifications, so you actually get a certification. And uh, yeah, check us out if you've if you've not seen those before. Yeah, no, I'm actually planning on uh, taking a few of them myself. I was oh, cool. looking at it the other day, and I was like, I, "This is something I want. I want to learn more about." And I was like, "That that would be a cool way of doing it." So, yep. um, but definitely, and uh, and and I've mentioned it on here before, but every every quarter through um, through my website, any stuff that that I sell there, I donate three percent back to. Um, conservation organization of, of my choice during the quarter. I always, always save Q4. That's always the, the national deer association, uh, one there. So, um, I'll be doing that again this year as it's, well, I am every, every quarter that goes through and trying to find a way. Now I don't do a ton of apparel sales, so it's not a lot, but it's some way to, to try to be able to give back financially and be able to do that. So, well, we appreciate it. And yeah. It's the, it's the thought and the mentioning of it. That all matters. Yeah. So, well, cool. Um, with that being said, Nick, uh, well, I guess we'll enjoy the, the rest of your day here and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, share it with your buddies, leave us a rating, a review and subscribe. If you want to check out more content like this, there's plenty in the links below. We truly appreciate having you guys along with us.